We are very happy to have with us today the pianist Marc André Amelin. Welcome to the Hine Verlag. You've just given a concert here in Munich last night and will play in Belgium tomorrow. So thank you very much for taking the time to visit our publishing house for this interview. It's a pleasure. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see um, the, the offices, you know, what, what, uh, what your um, facility looks like here. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, up to now, I mean, and uh, for I think any pianist, you know, all you are are blue covers. <laughs> That's what identifies you, you know, but now <laughs> I can see where you are. It's great. We at Hinde have just published three Urtext edition of works by Rachmaninoff, the 24 Preludes, the Etude Tableau and the Corelli Variations. And the fingerings for these volumes have been provided by none other than you, Marc-André Amelin. I remember when we met in December 2012 um, to discuss this project, you were at first a bit hesitant to take on the job. Were you skeptical about the idea of adding fingerings in general or... Maybe was it because of Rachmaninoff in particular? For example, how well did you know the works that I mentioned before? Well, I think at first I was hesitant because uh, I didn't know whether uh, editions really needed fingerings. Because, and I still think that uh, there are quite a few passages and sections of works which are uh, so obvious that they, they really don't need any commentary uh, or... Uh, or um, fingering elucidation from anyone, really. Uh, but there are, uh, actually, uh, after examining these works closely, I can say that uh, there are indeed suggestions that are possible to be made, uh, above and beyond what Rachmaninoff has already provided. So that's what I set out to do. In a few places, Rachmaninoff added fingerings himself, and they are very original sometimes. Um, have these fingerings been illuminating to you in some way? I mean, does it tell you something about the way he wanted his pieces to be performed? Well, first of all, uh, when I saw that he provided some fingerings, of course, I wasn't going to change them. And uh, I don't think, I mean, this, this, uh, this is a little bit long ago that I, that I did these, uh, these fingerings, but I, as far as I remember, I did not suggest any alternates when he provided his own because uh, I figured that he had specific results in mind. Uh, in one particular case, which I think uh, is one of your questions, um, it's very, very clear that uh, the fingering that he indicates, it's in the fourth etude tableau, opus 39, um, uh, really has a, an influence on the musical result. And it's a very, very simple thing. Um, Oh. So it's a simple descending scalar passage, but it's a, it's sort of a, a very marcato sort of um, um, style of music. So what he indicates is thumb and second finger, even with a thumb on the black key, which in um, music of the classical period is considered taboo, you know, but uh, here it's perfectly acceptable and there's an accent uh, at the end of the scale. So it, it helps the rhythmic contour of the piece. Um, I, and I think that is better than if you just fingered it the conventional way, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It wouldn't be quite as effective. So uh, that's a very, very intelligent uh, suggestion, and uh, I, I wasn't about to change it. <laughs> so that's, and that's just one example. Um, he did not provide a lot of fingerings overall, uh, only when he felt it was, uh, it was absolutely necessary. But um, my role in there was to supplement these, these suggestions, not with anything terribly personal, although, you know, I, I was thinking... Uh, that there are places which perhaps need clarification, uh, depending on your level of, uh, of pianistic ability for, uh, in order to ca tackle these things. Another interesting question, of course, is uh, what kind of hand do you write fingerings for? Because uh, Rachmaninoff had very large hands. I think he, he could span a twelfth. I, I, I myself can span an eleventh, uh, so just uh, from do to fa, and um, 
generally I tried to stick to fingerings which would benefit a large hand, even though uh, there are many pianists uh, who, who, or who tackle these things, who happily tackle these, uh, these pieces, uh, who have very, very small hands. But um, I've found that pianists who do have small hands somehow find a way to, uh, to, to get around the, uh, the, the writing and find, uh, find solutions. Uh, through creative peddling or, or whatnot, or, or, or certain other devices that I'm, I'm not aware of because I, I have a large hand and I don't have to worry about these things. <laughs> but um, I, I decided to, to really stick to the, the large hand philosophy, uh, the large hand sort of canvas in writing these fingerings. So with regard to your own fingerings that you have provided, maybe you could show us an example of a passage where you felt it was necessary to, to give a hint to the pianist? I think in most cases uh, the solution when there was no fingering was so obvious that uh, I, 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 I didn't feel that I could add any fingerings without uh, making the, the performer feel like an idiot for not thinking of it themselves. You know? But in certain cases, uh, there, I guess there's more personal uh, uh, things such as uh, this little passage here in the uh, Opus 39, number 9, Etude Tableau. Um, it's a simple pattern in thirds, and, and uh, it's uh, within a D major sort of scale, diatonic scale. Um, if you would follow the sort of accepted uh, concept that you shouldn't have too many thumbs on the black keys, then you would finger it, taking care to put second fingers on black keys. But personally, I find that it helps to have as much of the same movement as possible with each of, each of these thirds. So I put a thumb and third finger on every eighth note. establish the rhythm, uh, the, the regularity and uh, of the rhythm and also the, uh, the regularity of the accents. <laughs> Instead of <laughs> which is pretty much how you would finger a scale in thirds. So that's just one example really. Are there pieces that you got to know better while working on the fingerings and perhaps would consider playing them now more often in your concerts or maybe for the first time? I have to say that I, I haven't played all of these pieces but uh, working on these fingerings would definitely encourage me to, uh, to explore this literature further. I don't think I would necessarily play all of them but um, uh, there, are, there are some which I hadn't been as attentive to as I should and uh, which would make uh, a perfect addition to, to some of uh, the programs that I offer. Um, and uh, to answer another possible question, I think it is perfectly possible to uh, offer fingerings for things that you haven't played before. Uh, you approach this sort of thing with the in the same way as you would when you're learning a piece. Uh, finding fingerings is part of that process, whether you are playing the piece or not. What would you say? Which place does Rachmaninoff occupy in your repertoire in general? I think I'm very, uh, very likely to uh, to play more Rachmaninoff in the in the future. Uh, I I added a few preludes uh, in my repertoire a couple of years ago, and uh, I, I'd definitely be interested in looking at more of the uh, the Etude Tableau. I can't tell you how many people have actually said you know that you should look at the first sonata. Um, because uh, they, they, they really, really love it. it, it uh, the couple of times I've heard it, I, I have to say that it did not make an immediate impression, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know, because um, uh, I can think of other composers, Metner, for example, which don't make uh, uh, an, an immediate impression at first hearing, but then, you know, they um, gradually, you know, the music takes hold of you, and I'm sure that... Uh, in some of Rachmaninoff's uh, works, and it's the, it's the case as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think that something like uh, Rachmaninoff's Chopin variations, 
um, are a, is a very appealing piece, but it hasn't really re received its its due. I mean, uh, pianists are much more readily tackling the Corelli variations, but uh, I think the Chopin variations, even though it's an early work, is very very worthy of uh, of anyone's attention. I'm going to say in a uh, in a concert setting, it, it might be a little hard to digest yeah. having uh, all twenty four preludes. I I used to play all of Iberia in one uh, concert in. I, I thought it was a marvelous idea, but some people told me it's a lot of Spanish music in, in one recital. And in a rather long recital, too. <laughs> because I also used to add Navarra. <laughs> I think there is, there is a case to be made that there, is, that, that there will be never enough Rachmaninoff recordings. Because he's such a, he's such a vital presence and continues to be. And uh, I think his... Uh, presence in our lives is really growing and uh, it's especially amusing to consider past critical opinions of his music. If you look at the 1954 Grove, mm -hmm. there was an article, uh, the entry on Rachmaninoff written by Eric Blum, who was the, uh, the editor, said that uh, on the whole the music doesn't have much future, <laughs> if you can imagine that. <laughs> but at the time, you know, uh, Rachmaninoff really wasn't to us uh, what he is now. Mm -hmm. He's become a necessity. So do you think there are differences perhaps between America, Europe and Asia with re respect to Rachmaninoff's reputation or to the popularity of his works? I think, it, I think the, the, uh, Rachmaninoff's reputation is growing everywhere. I think he's, he's really essential for all of us. The immediacy, the uh, the uh, the wonderful melodiousness of the music, and uh, and uh, the way he just plunges directly into our hearts, you know, all of that, uh, we finally realized what uh, a great musician he was. And as I said, uh, one is what an essential ingredient he is to our lives. You've also played in in Russia, in Moscow. Uh, do you think there's a special feeling about it to play maybe in the same venues as Rachmaninoff did or in front of a Russian public? Oh, I think definitely. Uh, and, and I have. Uh, I remember one of the last concerts I gave there was uh, uh, I, I, I did the uh, second sonata, the, the 1931 version, uh, uh, also with a couple of preludes before. And, uh, and I, I have to say that uh, for one reason or another, I mean, there was a special warm feeling and uh, perhaps an added sense of occasion uh, when playing these for an audience who just lives, breathes and talks Rachmaninoff and eats <laughs> Rachmaninoff. Apart from Rachmaninoff, you have recorded many pieces um, from the Russian repertoire. You have recorded um, the complete Skriabin sonatas, um, the sonatas by Nikolai Metner, You've recorded an album with uh, music by Nikolai Roslavets. Is there something special that is appealing to you in Russian music that you wouldn't find in um, a different repertoire, even if you have recorded many other pieces from French or American composers? Uh, well, I think I, I've always been attracted to the richness of it. I mean, that, that's the word that really comes to, to my mind the most, is, is that uh, the... Uh, there is an incredible richness, in, 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 and there's there's uh, a, an unbelievable melding of craft and true inspiration. Of course, you could say that about you know, Bach and Beethoven, you know, but uh, um, there is something special in Russian music that I find that separates it from the rest. But I, I'm still really trying to identify exactly what it is. Of course, uh, there, there's uh, the, even Russian music varies in interest. Of course, I mean, the, the, but the best is uh, among the, the the very greatest that uh, I think I think there is, and sometimes in very many different ways. And there, there, there's and there's quite a few Russian Russian composers which are. Well, they clearly deserve more of our attention. I'm thinking of Lyapunov and his, and his transcendental etudes, which are really masterpieces of their kind. Marvelously conceived for, for the piano with uh, some wonderful ideas. And, uh, and uh, a composer named Georgi Katoir, who was in 
really complete obscurity for most of the 20th century because he's mostly remembered as a composition teacher at the Moscow Conservatory. But uh, his miniatures are really marvelous and I think surpass a lot of what, uh, for example, Lyadov or, or Rimsky-Korsakov wrote. They, re they really surpass him in interest. So, I mean, these are just examples. But uh, the, the, the font of Russian literature is, is very vast and uh, very worthy of further exploration. It's not always easy to uh, get access to the uh, printed music, of course, but at least now in this day and age, it's easier than ever. So you're not only a world-class pianist, but also a researcher, a musicologist in a way? Well, I, would, I wouldn't elevate myself to your position, of course, <laughs> but uh, uh, let's say I'm a, a, a great, great, great enthusiast. In conclusion, it should be mentioned that Marc-André Amelin not only provided the fingerings, but also gave us valuable advice with regard to possible mistakes in the historical editions, especially missing accidentals. So, we are convinced that our Rachmaninoff Urtext editions offer you the most reliable musical text there is today. And of course, we're looking forward to our upcoming joint projects. There will be certainly more Rachmaninoff in the future. Marc-André Amelin, thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure.